ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia, and we are here checking out a water strider, um, as requested by, um, by viewers last week. Um, let me go ahead, I've got a radar deep down really quick. I hope, <coughs> excuse me, I hope that everyone has had a, uh, a really great week. I don't know how many of you out there um, have been seeing insects in your local um, in your local environments. I do know we just had a had a uh, a cold wave move through the United States, and so if you're here in the U.S. and you got really cold, really chilly, um, the buggies all went back into diapause. They all went back to sleep, but hopefully they'll be back out uh, shortly, and we'll be able to play with all of the buggy friends soon. Um, <clears throat> So this water strider was requested. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and scooch the specimen so that we can see it from above. So now this specimen has its legs tucked. Um, and so it's why we have not actually seen this specimen during the live stream classes because um, I didn't think it was kind of in the best position to draw, but um, many of you have probably already seen what water starters look like while they're kind of swimming around. The air, their middle and hind legs kind of open up in a very like an X-shaped pattern, so they're nice and wide. Um, and we're just going to go ahead and we're going to use this specimen, but we're going to adapt and modify the legs. We're just going to make them so that it's standing at a, a more natural, um, in a more natural way. Um, <clears throat> to give you a little bit of an introduction on this specimen, this specimen is, was collected in Michigan. Let's see. Oh, um, it was collected in Michigan back in 2011. So this specimen is a handful of years old. I love that. It, it actually has an identification label on it to family, which means it was part of one of my university collections. Um, so this is our cute little water strider. The family that this specimen belongs in is Jaredy. So the Jareds are all of the water striders on the planet. Um, there's a good number of them. I'm not sure. I, I didn't look up the number of species in Jared, but it's a fairly large family um, for the true bugs. Uh, one really cool thing about water striders is that um, there is not a single insect on the entire planet that lives in the ocean, right? Salt water is an environment that um, insects, after they evolved and adapted to live, live terrestrially, they never turned around and went back into the ocean. They, there are no true insects, six-legged, three-body part insects, that live in the ocean. Um, some people argue that it's because invertebrates kind of started there, and so the things like the crab and the lobsters there, they've already found kind of all of the niches, and they haven't really left a lot of room for the insects. But an um, interesting thing is that there is one species of insect that you can find out in the middle of the ocean. Now, it's not living in the salt water, but there is one species of water strider that you'll find and it, it can run on the top of the ocean. And what it does is that if, um, if fish um, die and they float up to the surface, uh, that's what they end up eating. They end up eating any of the thing, things that kind of come up and float to the surface. Oh, welcome Liza! <coughs> you know what? That is totally okay that you've uh, you've been out and about. All of the sessions are recorded, so if you ever feel like you want to go back and rewatch one or you saw one you were really interested in, I uh, always invite people to um, rewatch or go check things out. So that's our family, Jarity, um, all of our water striders. Now, the genus on this individual, I just ID'd it with three characteristics. And the genus is Aquarius. So 
So right up here at the top, Water Strider. The common Aquarius in the region that I collected it is Aquarius Conformis. Although, um, I'm not going to say that it is Conformis or another species because admittedly, I'm not sure what the characteristics are that determine each, um, that determine the difference between those two species. So we're just going to leave it at Aquarius because I know that that's right and I can teach you how to ID it all the way down to that level. <clears throat> Greetings, Deb! Alright, so we've got Aquarius species. <coughs> there are... Let's see, I'm going to go ahead and move the specimen around and show you the couple of characteristics that determine that this is an Aquarius species water strider and not and none of the other genera. Um, the first thing that we look at is the hind leg. Probably can do this while we're drawing, but I kind of want to go through this really quick. And then I'll remind you while we're drawing. Okay. Water striders are so leggy. Their legs are so incredibly long. Alright, so we're looking at the hind leg. That is this leg that starts here. The femur is this whole piece all the way up to this point. Then we've got the tibia up till here and then the tarsal segment. <clears throat> For Aquarius, the tibia, we would say the metatibia, right, the tibia on the hind leg, is four times longer than the first tarsal segment. So, if you look here, this little tarsal segment here, you can put that tarsi, that tarsal, tarsimir, um, four times into that tibia. That's characteristic number one that's going to help us to identify this as Aquarius. Characteristic number two is this. This is the connexival spine, all right? And we call this a prominent connexival spine. Um, the other species of, the other genera of water striders will either be lacking this spine or it'll be really small. This is a really, really strong spine on the third to last, third to last segment of the abdomen. Right, there's two segments after it, but right there you've got that really, really strong spine. And the other characteristic, that third one that helps us ID this as a Aquarius, is if we're looking way up here at the head, this is the antenna that goes whoop and then boop ba doop ba doop. Uh, the first, let me remind, remind myself really quick, because I did write these down. <laughs> um, so the first uh, segment of the antenna is about double the length of the second and the third segments. They say, um, oops, didn't mean to turn off my camera. There we are. They say it's more than, it's just the, the first antenna mirror is more than 0.9 as long as antenna mirrors 2 and 3. They're just saying that the first antenna mirror is longer than 2 and 3. So it has a long first segment of the antenna and significantly longer than the second and third segments. That's all. That's what they're trying to tell you. 
Alright, let's look at this uh, water strider from the top and get sketching. Now, I do believe that this water strider is a nymph. Alright, it's immature because it does not have wings. Now, I do know that some of the species in this genus Aquarius have adults without wings. Um, so it's possible that it is an adult, but I believe that it's a nymph because um, if it is, if it's the species that I think that it is, then it would have wings. Um, but there's, there's no guarantee of that, so... Here we are. I can fit the whole specimen under a microscope, so what I'm doing is getting us a measurement from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen is 1.52 centimeters. So just a little bit over one and a half centimeters for the length of our um, water strider from the tip of the head to the end of the abdomen. It has a nice long thin body. I'm going to be drawing it um, face up just like this, but keep in mind that those that the legs are going to be very long. So if you want to keep your legs on the paper, make sure you start your body pretty small. All right. <coughs> so for the uh, for the head, all right. And you know me, I like to start my sketch with a l nice light sketch to start, and then we're going to zoom in and we're going to check out individual features and um, fix up our lines and things. So um, if you're following along with me, make sure that you have, bring an eraser and, um, and draw your first lines really nice and light. Um, the head up here at the top is... Um, kind of longer than um, um, longer than the average insect head, right? So a lot of times we're making kind of a D-shaped insect head, but with our water strider here, let's make sure the body stays. Let's see if I want my legs. Okay. All right, so um, we want to make sure that this head has parallel lines that move up before we kind of round off the top, but instead of actually um, making any nice round lines on our head here, we're going to create this box and then put a triangle on top of it, right about like this. Water striders are, I want to say they're predatory, um, but they will also eat things that are already dead. So um, they're just, they like to eat invertebrates and fish. Pretty much anything that's on the water surface. They do have venom, all right? They do have the ability to bite, so um, that's something that I didn't know as a kid and uh, would play with water striders, and I would handle them, and I never got bit, but then I had, I was playing with water striders with one of my friends, and my friend got bit by the water strider, and I didn't even know they would do that. <laughs> that was when I was little. <laughs> All right, so that is our head. The uh, pronotum, the first segment of our thorax, is kind of this uh, this um, oblong oval. So right about here, we've got kind of this oval shape. It is um, just a little bit wider than the head here. Let's see, right about like this. Alright, it's going to be a little bit narrower, but the head is going to get wider because I'm going to be adding those compound eyes in. So, probably right about there is about right. And keep in mind, we're going to be erasing some of this stuff too, so that's okay. <clears throat> now, this next plate, this plate goes over top of the thorax, and um, I want to say that 
where that that would be the sputellum. Yep. Um, so in our water strider here, what you can see this kind of this plate right here. This is the sputellum. <coughs> so in stink bugs, this body part is more triangular. But in our water strider, it is this type of really tall U shape. And then you can actually see the coxa are really strong and wide on this water strider. So if we look right about here, this kind of white piece that comes out, and these two here, those are all the coxa. Those are the hip bones where the legs get, the, the hip connections where the legs get connected to. All right. So um, I'm going to do, we're going to sketch out. Sorry, I lost my eraser for a minute. We're gonna sketch out the abdomen first and then we'll put we'll add the coxie on the side. So the abdomen is actually a little bit wider than the sputellum here, so we're gonna kind of bring it on out just a little bit wider to a point. It's funny because the uh, the whole body of the of the uh, water strider is um, very narrow. Right now, it looks a little bit like a chest piece. All right, and then we have the abdomen here. Let's see. It does come out to a point. You've got those um, those uh, spines, the connectable spines that you can see in the back, off the left and the right. Kind of pretty. I like them. So the abdomen is longer. Let's uh, let's get a measurement on this from the front of the head to the end of the thorax, which would be right about here. It's 0 0.79 centimeters, and then the abdomen is 0.72. So the abdomen is um, just a little bit shorter than the body here. <clears throat> so bloop, 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 right about, right about there. Maybe a little shorter. All right, so we're just gonna give ourselves a nice kind of rounded shape right there for the abdomen. And uh, that looks really funny, silly to me, but that's uh, that's right about how our how our water strider is going to start. Now, um, the legs of our water strider are going to be coming out really, really wide, kind of like, kind of like this. All right, so we're going to zoom into the head and we're going to get going on some of these really fine details. of our water strider, um, those compound eyes uh, are bulked out really far away from the, from the head here. And so what I always like to do when I'm sketching these big compound eyes for an insect like this is I'm going to start inside of the head that I sketched, a little bit inside, right about here on both sides. But then when I add the compound eyes, they are going to bulge outside of this line. It just helps make the compound eye... Um, look like it's kind of bulging away from the head a little bit, aka it looks like it has bug eyes. Alright, and then you can erase any of those sketchy lines on the inside of those compound eyes. Um, sometimes true bugs have ocelli, but this true bug does not have any ocelli. Um, The back of 
the head does not go straight across. So it goes kind of straight right about where the compound eyes are. But here's the interesting thing. Let's see. Let me erase some of this back. This right out here. Okay. So we've got these compound eyes that get nice and big. But then the head... Oh, this is cool. All right. So I made my compound eyes a little bit um, narrow, and I need them to be a little bit more round. A little more circular. Because then I can connect the bottom of the eyes here, and the pronotum is going to follow the bottom side of those compound eyes. Because you can see there's this um, kind of this shape here on the top of the pronotum that we'll be adding. <clears throat> All right, so for a true bug that is predatory, they need a piercing and sucking mouth part, right, for, to be a true bug. But to be a predator, your mouth part needs to be kind of short and stocky. That's the way that you're going to be able to um, feed, on, um, feed most easily and envenomate. So nifty thing. We go, I took a really quick picture of, there we go, of the bottom side of our water strider before class here. And that is the rostrum. That's the uh, mouth part of our, of our, the water strider we're looking at right now. And I like that from this direction, the eyes look red. I think that that's cool. Um, so you can see it does still have that piercing and sucking mouth part. It is still venomous, but that mouth part is short and stocky. They've got a little bit more control, and it's easier to pierce hard things when it's nice and short. Think about, like, a, like the difference between trying to push a thumbtack into a wall and trying to push, like, a really thin pin into a wall. Um, the thumbtack's going to be a lot stronger for predators, and then the really long, thin piercing and sucking mouth parts are for drinking on plants. Okay, so I'm actually pretty happy with this guy here, but I'm going to be making my head just a little bit shorter. But I'm happy with that, with that shape here. And then we're going to add these antenna. And I have to turn my specimen sideways to see the antenna a little bit. There we are. So one of the an one of the antenna is broken off at antenna mirror two, but um, one, two, three, four. The this species has a four segmented antenna. It is not a very long, not a very complicated antenna, but because it is long and thin and in theory straight, um, we would call this a filiform antenna. Spelled this way, if you're curious. It looks a little velvety. Yeah, it does. It has this really fine hair on it. And the hair that the water striders have, specifically on their feet, um, but I I would guess that it's on the bottom side of their body too, is hydrophobic hairs. They're hairs that will um, push away water and that helps them walk on water. Oh, right, cool. So the antenna are connected right up here to the left and right of the um, angles on the top of the head. Uh, they do have these kind of rectangular antennal sockets here and here off the side of the head before the antenna start. So when I'm adding mine, I'm just going to erase a little bit. And I'm going to add... these little rectangles here for our antenna sockets and then we're going to add the antenna so let's see the antenna okay I've got an idea about how long they are okay the first segment of the antenna is longer than the second and the third antenna segments even combined. 
So let's see, we've got one nice long segment, and then two, three, four. Sure. We'll go that again on the other side. One. to be just a little bit longer. Four. All right, so we've got <clears throat> our four antennal segments. We have our head all figured out. I'm gonna go back in and add the cross hatching within the compound eyes, because you know there's lots and lots of little individual, simple uh, little individual eyes inside of that inside of those compound eyes. So I want to share one more thing with you because this is a really cool microscopic image and there's two things. We, we talked about the um, we talked about the piercing and sucking mouth part and we talked a little bit about its velvetiness. but if we zoom in, I'm gonna zoom pretty far. Not that far, come back. All right. It's really, really close. I'll move this picture up a little bit. Hmm. There. Alright, so. If we look right about here, um, this is the bottom of the thorax, and it's kind of where the beak has the ability to, to touch the body. It almost looks like there's a ridge right here. I believe they can stridulate. They can make a really high-pitched squeaking sound by rubbing their beak right here on this um, on this ridge. There are a lot of there are a number of aquatic insects that have to use that that will use sound to communicate. Um, I did not fact check that before class, but I'm seeing that rostrum and that ridge right there thinking that um, it probably has the ability to stridulate with it. Um, stridulate is spelled like this, and it just means to rub two body parts against one another to make a sound. Crickets and grasshoppers also stridulate. in my voice when I called that a scutellum because that's kind of what it looks like but it felt very wrong to say out loud and now that we are nice and zoomed in on the specimen I can see that that whole piece is the pronotum itself that's one long shield um, so the top of the first segment um, of the thorax is expanded back all the way to uh, like the middle of the third segment of the thorax. Cool. So it's the pronotum. Sorry, my computer is lagging a little bit to, excuse me, to my computer is lagging a little bit today, and I guess I've just picked up the hiccups. So this will be a really, really fun live stream. <clears throat> All right, 
So the top of our pronotum here, remember it looks like a little bit of a mesa. So you've got the top part up here, but the pronotum does wrap a little bit around the back of the compound eyes before moving down. So make sure you kind of wrap sideways a little bit, and then we're going to come on down. Um, these line, the edges look like they could almost be parallel, but they are concave just slightly, just a little itty bitty bit right in the middle. And then they get just a little bit wider, so I'm seeing this little bit of a line that kind of comes in like this. So just like the slightest. Kind of like that. Even less so, maybe. There we go. So that's going to be your pronotum. It does have this really cool median line here. The uh, I was actually looking a little bit earlier for wing buds or anything like that because a lot of times late in star adults you can see where the wings are developing and you can see the triangular pieces and um, I think I have not seen like the 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 triangular wing buds like you expect to see on something like a true bug like this. Um, but where the wings would be connected, you have these. This guy right here and this guy right here. They almost look like little saddlebags that go off to the sides. Um, but they do look like there is a separation in between where these are and where the abdomen is. This is actually, this is the third segment of the thorax. Um, but there is a separation between these and the thorax. And so my, I would gather, I would gather that this piece here and this piece here are where the wings are developing on this species. Kind of nifty. All right, so we have <clears throat> we have the pronotum taken care of, but we do need to sketch out the width beyond the pronotum. So, kind of where these wings uh, would be developing. It just looks cool. I don't. I've never drawn a water strider before, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm really enjoying just kind of um, checking out all of the individual characteristics. I'm going to zoom in a little bit further just on this top piece because I want to get a better idea of this shape. And it almost looks like it's a little too bright. There we go. Cool. The front legs are so much shorter. What is the advantage? <clears throat> Um, the front legs are significantly shorter because the middle and the hind legs are meant for actually walking on water, whereas the front legs are predatory legs. Um, they're going to be able to catch an insect and kind of almost pull it up to their mouth, right? So they're, they are not raptorial legs like a praying mantis or a mantis fly or a giant water bug, but they're almost similar where they're really kind of short legs to sit up closer to the head, help them balance on the water up front, but then also help with the uh, bringing food to mouth situation. Good question. And good observation. We hadn't brought it up yet. All right. I'm going to add the last segment of the thorax here underneath and then come back up for where the wings are developing because I want to get this piece out here that starts up right at where this U is starting and then it's going to come down. Where did my pencil go? There he is. It's going to kind of come down like this and those lines stay parallel. And then once I have an idea as to where that is coming out, I know exactly how to draw these guys here. 
So way up closer to the top, right about here, is where this is going to be starting. And it comes out a little bit, and then it comes out kind of triangular-esque. And the fact that these are a little triangular makes me deaf makes me feel like they're wings because generally the wing buds are triangles there we are and then the leg is going to be connecting underneath those we'll be coming back for the legs So we've got these wide pieces coming out, but that actually takes into consideration those wings. So I'm going to double this line up and create those little, kind of like the saddlebag situation here. All right. And then this is... Well, we would consider the metanotum. <laughs> it's uh, the top of the last segment of the thorax. It comes out. It's got this really kind of pretty shape down here at the bottom. So I already have... And that comes out right about, right about even with these guys. All right, so we've got two um, I kind of upside down U's right about here and here off to the edges and then in the center it does arch up but it's just a little it's it's significantly less so there we go we've got that um that last segment of the thorax all figured out i'm happy with it and then we can we'll add the abdomen and come back for the legs I forgot that I was zoomed in so we can straighten it out. I only turn it sideways like that when it won't fit under the microscope straight. light outline of the abdomen that I did to start. I put a, I erased it just a little bit. I can still see that faint line in here. It's just going to help guide the length of the abdomen for me. Um, we want to make sure that the abdomen does not get too wide. The widest point in our, um, the widest point on our water strider is going to be right around here. And so the abdomen, just make sure it never goes past that. Um, it is kind of, um, it's arched outwards, so it does get a little bit fat, but it's not super duper fat. Here we are, so going nice, long, and thin. Then once you get to the end, we have those prominent connexival spines, my new favorite word for water striders. Not sure if prominent has, is an E or an A. I'll admit that. All right, so they're coming down to a point, but then once they get there, we're gonna come out and give it those really cool, pretty looking spines off to the left and the right. And then our abdomen continues down gets narrower and then at the very end I would say that this is not super super sharp 
but it does get even more narrow. So I'm going to make it kind of round down here at the bottom. Um, but I think that's cool. All right, so now we have these three, um, these kind of three regions on our abdomen. These two off to the left and the right, they're significantly thinner than the piece in the center. All right, so if we were going to say, you want to take these lines right about here where you have these arches, and that's where the segmentation is going to go. So we're just going to kind of parallel the inside of the abdomen here until we get to the end, and then it's going to follow that spine out. And then you're going to do it on the other side. This follows parallel, but then comes to the spine and then goes out. We have... One, two, three, four, five, six. Six abdominal segments um, before the spines. So if I was to add this segment right here, this region needs to have six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. So um, I'm going to subdivide this into six really quick. And these are sub-equal, they seem to me. So one two, three, four, five, six. That's about right. So the lines, the, the connections from the abdomen in the center, because the abdomen is kind of wider and thicker in the center, we're going to be making these lines as arched upwards, kind of like this. And then the um, when the abdomen gets over here to the edge, we're going to make them straight or angled up slightly. And I want to make sure that they all stay fairly similar to one another at their angles. Very good. So we've got those six, and then at the very, very end, these last two are split in half. We can even zoom in at the very end of the abdomen to see if there's anything special happening down there, but I do believe, yeah, it's just kind of a boring, it's just a little segment down there. It's a little bit wider after the spine, after those spines, and then shrinks down. Actually pretty happy with that. He's so cute so far. All right. Now I'm going to rotate the specimen so that we can see the, pro the first pair of legs. So if you, let's see, if you are looking at a water strider and it's running on the water, um, I'm going to draw a little, little sketch for us, maybe down here actually, um, <coughs> just a little lateral really quick. You've got the abdomen, you have the thorax, you've got the head here. The, um, the front legs, when they bend, they bend up, they come down really close to the front of the head. Um, whereas the middle legs and the hind legs kind of come out and they're going to be the ones that hold our specimen and help it walk on the water. All right, so those legs are going to be spread out in all directions, and then the front legs sit here. They help balance the head, but also are gonna help with this. Right here is where our front legs are connected to. I'm gonna be drawing my legs, it looks like, on the left-hand side, I'll probably have enough room. Um, the coxa is not visible from the top, but we can actually see, I'll give you the words, 
So there's Caxa, Trochanter, Femur, Tibia. And Tarsi. We'll get there. All right, so the Caxa is invisible from the top. It's right about here. Um, this piece here, the smaller piece, that's the Trochanter. It's kind of like a knee, but it's in between the hip and the femur. All right, it just helps bend the femur into the right direction. And you got the first segment here. This is the first one that's visible from the top. That's the femur. This guy here is the tibia. And then we have two tarsal segments with these really cute little itty bitty tarsal claws that don't seem like they can do much of anything. Oh, ha, I turned off my camera. Here we are, okay. So the femur is coming up. Nice and long, but not as long as the middle and the hind legs. We got the femur. So the femur, funny enough, is just a little bit longer than the first, and then the first um, antennal segment. All right. The tibia is next, and on this specimen, I'm just going to draw the tibia coming up. I'm going to make the tibia coming towards the center of the body here. It is sub-equal to the femur, so if I was just going to take the femur like this, rotate it, my tibia is going to end up right... It was end up right underneath the antenna, but I made it just a little bit longer than the antenna, so it didn't look silly. And then we have two tarsal segments. And I'll show you these silly little tarsal claws, because um, a lot of times tarsal claws have a little bit of strength or structure behind them, but they're not really going to do much with these. So you can see their tarsal claws almost just look like two little hairs. And those tarsal, there's only two tarsi right there. One, two, itty bitty teeny tiny segments. So we've got one, and then two, and little itty bitty little tarsal claws. Oh, they're so cute. Okay, so that's leg one, or you can call it the pro leg. Hello, Hashi, welcome. that you're late. We are just happy you're here. Alright, so let's look at this uh, water strider from the top first really quick. Because I am curious, I don't know if we ever actually, I don't think we ever actually measured the leg. And I want to see if the length of the femur is equivalent to the length of the body. Because it very well looks like that. <laughs> so let's, um, the body is 1.52 centimeters. So I'm going to push this back so that we can see all of the legs. Specifically, I just want to measure the length of this femur here. just a little bit over one centimeter. So, um, if we were going to come up with an equivalent for that, hmm. I guess we'll just say two-thirds of the length of the body. So if 
you take your body, you divide it out into equal thirds, that is going to be the length of the femur of your water strider. It's so long! I definitely made my body too big. I even warned you guys of, you ladies and gentlemen, of this earlier, but alas. So, from the top, before we turn it over, we can see the coxa and the trochanter from the top of the middle and the hind legs. So that's why I wanted to see it here first. This little rectangle right here, and this little rectangle right there, that's the coxa. The trochanter starts right about here, and there's a triangular segment. It follows up this line and comes back. You can see that there's a little bit of a glare here. That is where the trochanter is. So when we're adding our femur, it's going to be right about here. It's got, the, it's this rectangle piece in that space that we left before the hind wings. And then the trochanter is that triangular piece that's going to be kind of coming up in this direction. It's that little um, piece that's like a knee in between the hip and the femur. And then the femur is really, really long. So... Right around here. Right, femur. But then you have tibia and tarsi. So let's go look at the tibia. They're so leggy. this point, then the tibia starts here, comes all the way back to right about here. So, technically the tibia is shorter than the femur. Not by much. Um, I would say that the tibia is about half of the length of the body. So, um, my tibia is going to be going way, way off of the paper. So instead of allowing it to go off the paper, I'm going to do something bad and I'm going to fold the leg backwards. That's what I'm going to do. So right about here at the end of the femur, I'm going to let the tibia come backwards, and I just want to make sure that it is shorter than the femur here. Tarsi are tucked behind the hind leg on that side. I'm going to switch to the other side and see if the tarsi are easier seen. They are. Alright, so this middle leg has three tarsal segments. So if we're looking here, oh, it just went blurry, or my vision went blurry, one or the other. There we are. 
three tarsal segments. Uh, the first one is this one that goes here up until right around here, and then two and three. So this first tarsal segment is about the same length as two and three combined. And all three of them are about half of the length of the tibia, if you wanted to get some ratios happening. So you can always take the length of your tibia, bring it down. Technically, if I wanted it, it would go out like this. I don't have room. So we've got three segments. One. Oops. Need to make sure they stay narrow. And then two segments that are about half with the cute little tarsal claws at the end. And that is where it would be walking on water. So there's your water ripple. <laughs> cute. All right, let's look at the hind leg. So this right here is our hind leg. The femur on the hind leg is about the same length as our middle leg, and it's all going to be very similar except connected underneath this piece instead of up here. So right underneath um, our, we were calling it a saddlebag, but I believe it's a wing bud. Um, We've got a rectangular piece here, that's the coxa, where the hip, where the leg gets connected to. And then you're going to have the trochanter. And the trochanter angle is always going to help that femur bend. And because we're going backwards, the uh, angle on the trochanter is actually going to be going in this direction instead, so that the femur can come out kind of like this. All right, and our femur oops, has to stay nice and thin. We'll get there. Alright, so that is our nice long femur. Then our tibia is going to come backwards. That tibia is um, just a little bit shorter than the femur once again. So I'll take this femur, I'll rotate it out, and then shorten it up just a little bit. We're going to end up right around, we're going to go right about here. For that tibia, and then these little tarsal segments are here at the bottom. And where our first leg had two tarsal segments and our second leg had three tarsal segments, I expected the third one to also have three, just like the middle leg. But there are only two segments here. Cool. Keep in mind, one of the distinguishing characteristics of this genus of Aquarius is that the hind tibia is at least four times as long as the first tarsal, as the first tarsal segment.
Tarsamir is, uh, I say Tarsal, but a lot of, a lot of people will also say Tarsamir. And I was reading one that said that. Oh, right. So, here we are. Let's see. So just make sure that this first tarsal segment is four times shorter than the tibia. And then one that's even half that size with two little itty bitty teeny tiny claws. And that is where the ripples would occur because that is where the water starter is walking. That's really cool. And then they'll have the ripples up here too on the front leg. Gotta finish the ripples if I've got them on the on the middle and the hind legs. That is our cute little water strider. Um, we haven't had a very active uh, we haven't had a very active chat in the in the chat box, but I hope that you've sincerely enjoyed um, hanging out and uh, drawing this water strider together. Um, water striders are going to lay their eggs in and around the aquatic environment, but generally not on the water. They don't lay like rafts of eggs or anything like that. They lay eggs and they glue them to things. Like uh, they'll lay eggs on vegetation or plant material that's above or right near the water. They will also glue their egg uh, glue their eggs to like rocks along the sides of the water so that once those eggs hatch the nymphs can enter the water body. Uh, because it's a true bug they have simple metamorphosis so when they hatch from their egg they look like a little itty bitty water strider. They're really cute um, and then when they um, when they become an adult Generally, they are going to get wings, but there are some water striders that even as adults never gain wings. Um, fun things about water striders is that even though they're aquatic, um, because most of them have wings, many of them will fly around at nighttime. <laughs> um, so if you're ever out and about at like a gas station, or um, anywhere with really bright lights at night, you might end up you might end up seeing a good number of aquatic insects. Actually, there's a number of aquatics that will come out of the water and fly around at night, and then that's going to actually help them move from water body to water body. So this water strider here, if it's um, if it's water dried up, it'd have a difficult time going somewhere because this is a nymph and it doesn't have wings yet. But the adults, if their water dries up, they can just fly to a new pond or a new lake. Why do some antenna have many segments and some like the water strider only have a few? It's just the way that um, that the antenna have adapted and changed over time. Um, every antenna has its own kind of purpose. So that's a tricky one for me to answer. Um, I can give you characteristics of the types of antenna, like for instance the water strider um, have having these kind of longer, the, each of the segments is longer, right? But the antenna overall are not really, really long, like a longhorn beetle, right? Um, the antennal segments themselves are longer, which actually limits their ability to bend and move. So if you think about, let's say, what's a good way to, oh, I know. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, wish. So, um, the more segments that an antenna has, the more that it's able to bend and move. Because exoskeleton is solid. It doesn't move, it doesn't bend, right? So the b insects are only bending at their joints, kind of like suits of armor. So here, there is a lot less flexibility. It can only bend in one, two, three places. Whereas, for instance, like a butterfly, 
guy, like the uh, like the monarch that we saw last week that had really, really long antenna and hundreds of little itty bitty segments, lots and lots and lots and lots of them, every single one of those lines, every single one of those new segments on a butterfly's antenna helps it to bend and move and stays super mobile. Um, and butterflies depend on their antenna a lot to, uh, to sense the world around them, to um, detect... I would say probably to detect pheromones and to pick up on flower cues. They're going to be using their antenna a lot. Whereas water striders, to find their food source, a lot of times they're going to be feeling the ripples in the water. So if an insect um, that's flying around dives down at the water or falls into the water and gets stuck and it starts to kind of splash around in the ripples in the water, the water striders can feel those ripples in the water and they'll run at them and they will feed on that insect. Um, so maybe it's about communication. I would say that there's probably not a really great answer, but there's a lot of guesses that we could make. Um, so, yeah, they're going to be feeling all of those really fun ripples in the water. Let's see. They also have that ability to stridulate with that, uh, with the beak that we showed you. Um, uh, right here. So they can take, um, they can take their beak and run it up against the bottom of their body and make this squeaking sound. Um, I'm not exactly sure where their their sense their where their sound like where they their equivalent of an ear would be like how they hear. I'm not sure. You know what we didn't look at? We didn't look at the spiracles on the abdomen. We should do that. So this is the, oh, cool, we didn't really even zoom in too much on the abdomen. So this is the, uh, this is the top of the abdomen, and you can see it's very, very flat. I'm not seeing any holes for the spiracles. So what we need to do is flip the specimen, maybe we'll go sideways first. And now we're going to look at the side of the abdomen. There they are. All right. Okay, so the spiracles, or their, um, their, essentially their breathing holes, are right here along the side of their abdomen. This white dot here, that is a spiracle. And they run all the way along. Every single, it appeared that most of these segments had a spiracle. Let's see how many of them have one. One, two, three, four, five. It appears that the only abdominal segment... So, if we're looking at these up here, A1 does not have... A1 does not have a spiracle, but A's A2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. A2 through 6 has a spiracle uh, right underneath this ridge here. So when we're looking at this specimen from the side, um, you can a little bit easier see this ridge. This here is that narrow piece that comes out, and this portion, that center region, that's actually where the abdomen is coming down in the bottom. So if you were going to place the spiracle, um, it would actually be right here on the inside of that ledge on the bottom. Oops! Just not on the first one. Went through a line! Alright, let's see if I have any other questions. <laughs> That's all right, Deb. You're allowed to yell about ripples. That's totally cool. <laughs> all right, let's 
see. My favorite thing about water striders is the fact that there is a species of water strider that you can find just hanging out in the middle of the ocean. That's that's by far the my favorite thing about water striders. Um, they do have an issue walking on oil slicked water because oil slicks are going to decrease the water tension on the top of the water and um, it'll break the water tension and the water striders can fall through and that's, well not really fall through because they're hydrophobic, but they can have problems um, if in oil spilled regions. Now, um, if you were ever looking around at a river or a lake or you were trying to do a little bit of maybe um, biomonitoring and you noticed that there was uh, oil on the top of the water, like a really shimmery oil slick that we have all seen and don't love. Um, oil can be both natural and man-made. So there's actually a way, an easy way for you to tell. Um, you can just take a stick or your finger or, I don't know, the back of your paintbrush, whatever you have on you, and you're going to put it into the water and you're going to break up the oil a little bit. If it is a natural oil, it's going to separate in the water and then it'll stay separate and it'll kind of float around, but um, it's not going to recongeal. Whereas man-made oil, an oil slick that was man-made, um, that oil, if you break it up in the center, it's just going to all congeal back together again. So that is how you tell the difference between man-made versus natural oil slicks and water bodies. Reading that there are three main frequencies found in ripple communication. Repel, threat, and courtship. That's really cool, Liza! I'm gonna have to read more about water strider communication! Because I knew that they, with that, with that stridulation, I knew they could communicate, but it actually, it didn't occur to me that they could communicate with one another using the ripples in the water, and that makes me happy. What happens if they become submerged? Right, water striders are covered, or at least I believe those hairs on the bottom are going to be examples of hydrophobic hairs also. So generally they've got hydrophobic hairs. Here, I'll write that word for us. Um, they have hydrophobic hairs at the ends of their tarsal claws, but also you can see they have those hydrophobic hairs all around the bottom of the abdomen too. So if the water strider was, say, walking around on the top of the water and then sunk underneath it, if it gets, like, pressed underneath the water, um, the water is still not going to touch the bottom of the abdomen. What will happen if the water strider goes under the water? I can't draw this. But what happens if the water strider goes under the water is it will carry a water bubble, an air bubble with it. Right? So the bottom of the abdomen, at least, would end up looking really, really shimmery and shiny because it has a very, very thin layer of air around the edges. And they would create... Um, essentially a plastron for themselves, but that's not where they want to be, right? They would much rather be on the top of the water, so my guess would be is they would float back up to the surface and then try and get away, fly away or run away, if they were having a hard time sitting on top of the water. Can they breathe underwater like when a wave takes them under? Love that question. Yes. They can breathe underwater, and that's what a plastron is. Let's talk about it.
so let's say I've got, we're just going to use like one segment of the abdomen. So right here, we have this segment of the abdomen, I have this little spiracle here, and I have this little bit of a ledge up here on the top. All right, and oh no, our, um, our water strider got splashed by water because its breathing holes are on the bottom side of its abdomen. You would think that it'd want to be on the top, but those spiracles are surrounded by these little hydrophobic hairs. Hydrophobic just meaning that they push water away. Um, they do not allow water near them. And anytime they approach water, the water cannot come close to them, so they will carry whatever is around them underneath. So they will have oxygen. So let's say that he's got this cute little bubble of oxygen around here, um, or air, and there's oxygen in it. There's dissolved oxygen in the water, and there's dissolved oxygen in this air bubble. And from now on, we're calling this air bubble the plastron. This is how a lot of aquatic insects breathe um, when they don't have gills. So you've got this plastron. And as the water strider is pulling the oxygen from the plastron into its body, um, the, oxyg the dissolved oxygen from the water is going to diffuse into the plastron. So in fact, they not only can breathe if they were underwater, but they can breathe infinitely as long as the water is highly oxygenated. Yeah. So this, um, the, the hydrophobic hairs allow oxygen and push out the water. Just love it. I we'll love the, the science behind it all. He's so cute. Um, there's actually a really fun video that I made about um, hydrophobic hairs and the use of a plastron for an aquatic moth. There is a noctuid that is absolutely covered in hydrophobic hairs. A noctuid is a species of moth, and, or a family of moths, but this is one species. It's two genera that do this, but um, they have a moth and it's going to dive under the water and because the moth is covered in these hydrophobic hairs, the moth carries this oxygen just like this down with them and then they lay their eggs under water and their caterpillars are completely aquatic and they chew themselves like a little disc for the top and the bottom and they make themselves a little home out of two little leaf discs and they live in this little leaf disc home and they have, the caterpillars have gills so that they can breathe underwater and they'll spend all of their, they will um, pupate underwater and then when they emerge, swim up to the surface, dry off their wings and then fly away. So cute. I once had collected an aquatic caterpillar. I no longer have that specimen but I know where I collected it and I'm gonna go back there this summer because I'm back in Michigan. We're going to see if I can find one more. Um, <clears throat> I just call them aquatic moths. Let's see what the species on them is. Because I do not, I don't think, I don't think that they have a common name. Bellura. So it's a species of cutworm moth, would be the subfamily. But um, you can look up my YouTube video. I think I just call them aquatic moths. Could be fun to watch. Um. Here.
there's your, uh, there's your family name. Uh, there are two different types of aquatic, um, aquatic caterpillars, or at least two families that have aquatic caterpillars. That's one of them that's really fun. The other aquatic caterpillar, um, is actually one that lives inside of the stems of cattails, right at the base of the water. So you have to find the dead cattail stems and pull them out and open them up right at the base, and that's where you'll find the little, ca the, these caterpillars. And I say little, but these are like really chunky caterpillars that kind of fill up the inside of a cattail stalk. Really cool. No problem, Liza. Happy to have you back. All right, so I think we've discussed a good amount of stuff. I'm not sure if you have any additional questions, but if you do, you can always let me know. Um, I'm going to switch over to this screen. Why is my camera so tall? We're going to shrink my camera a little bit. That's better. Okay. You're welcome. This is what my water strider looks like at full size, if you want to see it. I know that some of you like to see them full grown. My water strider. Let's see. Focus! There we are. Cute little friend. Nice long legs. And a couple of educational sketches. Um... Thank you so much for hanging out with me, chatting about bugs. I absolutely love it. Um, I know I've been asking you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, which insects you want to draw in the upcoming weeks. So if there is a family or a group of insects that you would really like to draw that we haven't drawn yet or we haven't drawn in a while, I would love to pull out a specimen. Um, so, Liza, you said you hope to be here next week. What do you want to draw next week? It is up in the air, um, so whoever has an answer, feel free. Um, that is a reminder for me to say, I teach on out school. I teach, uh, my classes right now are only Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. That helps me stay, um, that helps my weekends, um, stay available for travel, and I have Mondays and Fridays, well, weekends for being somewhere, and Mondays and Fridays for traveling, um, I'm traveling about half of the weekends this year, so, um, but if you know a student between the ages of 5 to 8, 9 to 12, 13 to 18, um, feel free to use the link in the description box and get $20 of free classes. That is a reminder to subscribe to my YouTube channel so that you can chit chat with us in the chat box. Um, that is a quick uh, QR code, a link to my PayPal. If that does not work for you, there is a link in the description box below. If you'd like to throw me a couple dollars, feel free to do that. This is my passion, this is what I love, and this is what I do full time now. Um, over here at Insectopia2015, that is my Facebook and Instagram tag, Facebook and Instagram tags. So if you would like to share any of your drawings, feel free to tag me. And if you want to email me, this is my email right here, Trisha at theinsectopia.com. I hope that you all have a fabulous rest of your week. Um, I am looking at insects. Let's see, what do we want to draw? What do we want to draw? What do we want to draw? What if we draw a haliplid? I haven't looked at this haliplid yet under my, my microscope. Let me look really good. I mean, he's cute. He's not a haliplid. He's a weird diving beetle. What? He's cool. I don't know. Um... Nope. All right, I will go ahead and look through my collection and see if any of these friends want to be drawn. You know what? We haven't drawn a um, we haven't drawn a stonefly adult yet, and we just drew a water strider, so we're in an aquatic mood now. 
Let's draw an adult stone. I'm gonna I'm gonna draw an adult stone fly unless somebody else comes up with an answer that's better. I hope you have a fabulous rest of your week. Thank you for hanging out with me for an hour and a half. Really appreciate it. Let me know if you see any cool bugs in your local region. Email me cool bug pictures. I love to see them. All right. Have a fabulous week and.